were pitched. He shouldn't have done it. Like a projectile, the ball left the Ruthian bat to scream on a line over the right center field barrier. As long as baseball's played. That story I just shared with you is the story of the called shot. Not just one of Wrigley Field's most historic moments, but perhaps all of sporting life. The audacity of a man to call out another competitor on the field of play in team sports in championship play and actually perform the task. That's the making of legend. For those of us of certain age with maybe a little gray in the beard, I can only go back to maybe one other event in team sports where someone actually quote unquote called that shot. And you gotta go back to the Super Bowl with Joe Namath back in 1969 where they actually pulled off that stunt. It would be Babe Ruth's last home run in World Series competition. It's stories rich, isn't it? Yeah. A lot of texture to it, right? Sure. It's Casey at bat, except for Casey hits the home run. The story's so rich, it's actually part of American folklore. It's right up there with George Washington taking the silver dollar and throwing it across the Potomac, chopping down the cherry tree. But there's a strange thing about folklore, isn't there? There's usually a little bit of truth and then a tall tale that follows, right? So let's get to the truth of this called shot story, shall we? You gotta set the Wayback Machine back to 1932. 1932 Chicago. Babe Ruth had been out the night before in my fair city. <laughs> and when he came to the ballpark the next day for workouts, he wasn't quite feeling 100%. Perhaps some of you guys might know some of that feeling. I saw you guys <laughs> running out there. But the Cub fans knew that. And when Babe Ruth left that dugout, the Cub fans were watching him and they were taunting him. They were throwing lemon peels at him, taunting him. So when the Babe got to that home play, he saw Gabby Hartnett at the, at the, catcher's, at the catcher's spot. He tapped Gabby Hartnett and he said, better tell them boys to back off. I only need to hit one. He surveyed the field. He saw Billy Jurgis playing shortstop. Many of you may not know who Billy Jurgis is, but how many of you by a show of hands have seen the film The Natural? Roy Hobbs was Billy Jurgis. Billy Jurgis was shot at the Hotel Carlos, just a couple blocks north here of the ballpark. Babe Ruth had a big problem with Billy Jurgis. You see, when the Cubs were playing and Billy Jurgis got shot, they had to replace him with someone. And they found a guy by the name of Mark Kennick. He was part of Murderer's Row with the New York Yankees. So Kennick was playing shortstop while Billy Jurgis was getting better. But when it came time for the Cubs to give out their share of World Series cuts, yep. Mark Kennick got half a share, Billy Jurgis got a full cut. Mark Kennick was still tight with Babe Ruth, and when he saw the Babe, he told Babe Ruth that the Cubs were a bunch of cheapskates, <laughs> and it was Billy Jurgis' fault. So when the Babe was at a home plate, he pointed out Billy Jurgis calling him a cheapskate. Oh. So you have Babe Ruth not feeling quite 100%, a cheapskate named Billy Jurgis at short, and then you had Charlie Root on the mound. Charlie Root does not deserve to be an exclamation point or an asterisk in Babe Ruth's career. He was a dominating pitcher, one of the most dominating pitchers the Cubs had ever had. Charlie Root hated the called shot story. In fact, when the producers of the Babe Ruth story approached Charlie Root, they approached him because they wanted him to be in the Babe Ruth story. Now, there are great baseball movies, right? Field of Dreams. You want to play Catch Dad? <laughs> the Natural, all great films, right? The Babe Ruth story with William Bendix is not one of those great movies, okay? <laughs> but the producers reached out to him and they 
say, Charlie, we'd like you to recreate that great moment. You know, <laughs> you pitched the ball and Babe Ruth hit it out of the park. Charlie Root looked at the producers and said, son, if I thought Babe Ruth was going to hit it out of the park, I wouldn't have thrown it down the middle of the plate. I would have thrown at his skull. True story. <laughs> Now in my 21 years of giving tours here at this ballpark and being a Wrigley Field historian, there are only two facts I am absolutely certain of about the called shot. Number one, Charlie Rupp pitched the ball and the babe hit it out of the park. But the second fact I think is more important, part of why we're here today, right? You see that great moment in baseball history? That moment of American folklore that still continues on to this day where little boys and little girls as some of them are wrapping up their little league season maybe straightening up their back and pointing it didn't happen at Fenway Park the oldest ballpark in baseball it didn't happen at Chavez Ravine out in Los Angeles the second oldest ballpark in the National League it didn't happen at Sox Park over on the south side <laughs> didn't happen at Yankee Stadium, the house that Ruth built. It happened here in Chicago. It happened here at Wrigley Field. My name's Brian, I'll be your tour guide. I'm backed up by my good friend Tim. Tim, how long have you been here? Uh, what? What? So between Tim and I, Tim's been here since... Not 1914. <laughs> 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 it's all an honor, Tim. So, between Tim and I, we've got 25 years of experience here at Wrigley Field. I'm also the guy who wrote the Wrigley Field tour, so I think you're in good shape. If you got a question, just raise your hand and do my. I'll do my best to answer it. If I can't answer it, I'm going to look to Tim. If Tim can't answer it, I'm going to make up an answer. <laughs> but I'm going to say it in such an authoritative voice that you guys are going to believe it. Actually, that's, we'll, we'll get you the answer. Number two, if you've got a cell phone or pager or watch, just set it. Set it to vibrate or stun, that will, that will help. <laughs> you guys are going to get a different vantage point than you did when you're out on the field. I encourage you to take pictures, but take them while I'm talking. It's a good sized tour. I'm not easily distracted. And that's that. Last thing is Tim will get us through the tour. We're going to start here, work our way out to the bleachers, upper deck, and then I'm going to get you out to Gallagher Way, all right? All Does that right. sound good to you guys? Yep. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's better. All right. Okay, all good tours have a beginning, middle, and end, and all good stories are the same. So let's get to the beginning, how this ballpark came to be. You gotta set the way back machine all the way back to 1913. 1913, Chicago. Back in 1913, there was a guy by the name of Charlie Wiegman. Charlie Wiegman was a restaurateur here in Chicago. This is a guy you wanted to know back in 1913. He had 11 different restaurants in downtown Chicago. He had two billiard halls, even a moving picture house. Like I said, this is the guy you wanted to know. And the reason why you wanted to know him, he was cash rich. This guy had a lot of cash. And Charlie Wiegman wanted to be part of baseball like nobody's business. Tried to buy the Chicago Cubs, the Cubs said no way. Tried to buy the St. Louis Cardinals. Again, the Cardinals said, back off, we don't want you. If you think about Charlie Wiegman, the problem was he was new money and organized baseball wanted nothing to do with that. Charlie Wiegman, Mark Cuban, okay? Very similar, they just didn't want him part of this thing. Well, if you're from Chicago, any of you guys from Chicago? Good. Sure. Number of you from Chicago, you can hear me back there? If you're from Chicago, you know if someone says they got some money to spend, there's a bunch of us that are willing to take that money, right? And the group that was out there to take some of that money was a group called the Federal League. There were three major leagues in baseball at the time. The National League, the American League, and then this upstart called the Federal League. Back in 1913, the Federal League was playing semi-professional baseball over by DePaul University where the Fullerton and the Red Line come together, okay? There's a problem with it, though. The Federal League was tearing up the grounds. 
And a Catholic priest there, the Catholic athletic director there said, you know, Charlie, there's a league out here that wants to find an owner and I want them off my property. I got an idea for you. There's some land at Clark and Addison that used to be the site of a Lutheran seminary, not a cemetery. <laughs> a Lutheran seminary was on this spot. I got an idea. Why don't you buy the team and I'll show you where you can build a ballpark. Charlie Wiegman liked the idea of being an owner, especially in a, in a town like Chicago, then the second largest city in the country. He said, okay. So the athletic director and him walked over here to Clark and Addison, where they actually walked the space of what would become Wiegman Park. Charlie made an offer to the Federal League. The Federal League wanted to become a professional league. They said, fine, we're off and running. In February of 1914, after Charlie Wiegman hired a guy by the name of Zachary Taylor Davis to be architect, they began construction. Zachary Taylor Davis was known for building ballparks that were made out of brick, concrete, steel, ballparks that would not burn up. Zachary Taylor Davis put some plans together, and in February of 1914, construction started. Wiegman Park was constructed in eight weeks' time at a cost of $250,000. Basically, the lower section that you're in right now, lower 14,000 seats, all belong to Charlie Wiegman. Charlie Wiegman had a ballpark. Let's talk about the team, the Chicago Federals. The Federals were led by a guy by the name of Joe Tinker. Tinker to Evers to Chance, that great double play combination. Joe Tinker was a player manager on that team. Chicago Federals were off and running. They won their first game against the Kansas City Packers by a score of nine to one. By the end of the 1914 season, the Federals, the Chicago Federals, or the Shy Feds as they were known, came in second place in the Federal League. They outdrew the Chicago Cubs that year. Chicago oh. Cubs at the time were playing on the west side of Chicago in Chicago's Little Italy neighborhood. If you're familiar where the Illinois Medical District is, that's where the Chicago uh, the Chicago Cubs were playing. This cut the Sox were playing on the south side over at Comiskey Park. Wiegman felt he had a good thing going. He was right close to the Northwestern train lines. He had everything he wanted, but he didn't have the respect of the league. He wanted to compete against the American League and National League, and they didn't want him again. This time, Wiegman did something different. He filed a lawsuit in federal court, decided to go file that lawsuit, and that lawsuit went in front of a guy by the name of Kennesaw Mountain Landis. Anyone know who Kennesaw Mountain Landis was? He eventually became baseball's first commissioner. At that time, he was the trust buster. This is the guy who took John D. Rockefeller, the richest man this nation will ever know, down to his knees and broke up the Standard Oil Trust. This was a substantial judge. This was a judge who was gonna break open baseball's trust. But they didn't realize was that Kennesaw Mount Landis was a baseball purist. Thought there should be a National League and an American League and that would be it. But we still got baseball to play. 1915, Wiegman decides to change his name from being the Chicago Federals to the Chicago Whales. Waveland Avenue, Wales. A whale in 1915 was a big thing. It was the biggest thing in town. And Wiegman's ego was such that he wanted to be the biggest man in town. In fact, he got a guy by the name of Mordecai Three Finger Brown to pitch for that team. You may remember for longtime Cup fans, we had a guy named Al Fonseca who had six fingers, right? Mordecai Three Finger Brown made it to Cooperstown with just three. Wow. 1915, Chicago Wales end up winning the Federal League Championship in 1915. In fact, they are still the defending champions of the Federal League. The Federal League folded at the end of the 1915 season. Too many ballparks were being built. Too many players that were making too much money were being signed. They couldn't afford to keep it going. And this lawsuit problem was a big one. Kennesaw Mountain Landis decided not to rule on the lawsuit, rather deciding, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna force you guys to settle. Part of the settlement allowed Charlie Wigman to buy into a National League franchise. 
That franchise for sale? The Chicago Cubs. Oh, really? Cubs were owned by the Taft family of Ohio. Taft produced two things, newspapers and politicians. In fact, they produced a guy by the name of William Howard Taft. William Howard Taft was the governor of the Philippines, vice president of the United States, president of the United States, chief justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. No American politician has ever had the career that William Howard Taft has. Unfortunately, William Howard Taft goes down in history for a couple things. One, he was the fattest guy to ever be in the White House. In fact, <laughs> William Howard Taft was so large, Hello. Hello. How are you? Thank you. You've been on tour for 12 minutes and you finally joined. Thank you. He was so large that when he stood up during the seventh inning of a baseball game, out of respect to the presidency, everyone stood up with him, hence creating the seventh inning stretch. It's folklore, but attributed to Taft. What Taft should really go down in history for is he's the first president to throw out a first pitch at a Major League Baseball game. Ah. Every single American president except for one. Jimmy Carter threw out a first pitch at a Major League Baseball game. Carter, a part owner of the Atlanta Braves, actually put a softball field on, on the White House grounds. One-term president didn't have time to do it. <laughs> anyway, the Tafts also owned the Cincinnati Reds. So, Wiegman, along with a consortium of men, which included J. Ogden Armour, Armour Hot Dogs, Arthur Lasker, a PR guy, and a chewing gum magnet by the name of William Wrigley, found six other guys, put together $500,000, bought the Chicago Cubs, took them from the west side, and moved them here to Clark and Addison in 19, for the 1916 season, where the Cubs would actually win their first game against the Cincinnati Reds, seven to six in extra innings. Wiegman was on a roll. By 1918, the Chicago Cubs are in the World Series. It's pretty good. Two years of ownership, he's already got them in the World Series. And when they play the World Series, they decide to play the games over at Comiskey Park, because Comiskey Park was bigger.